So, first Sunday of 2019, we're going to start a new teaching series, which will cover the next three weeks, that I called, Look After Yourself. Look After Yourself. A lot of people have got that in mind, of course, with it being New Year's, right? I was, uh, the other morning, I, I got up and uh, I said to Jill, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out for a walk in the morning, and then um, I tried to get out quietly, um, but my quietly is apparently not that quiet. And so I got out and got ready, and, and, and then I'm downstairs, and then I hear her, and she says, are you going out in the dark? I said, yeah. Are you walking in the dark? Yeah. And she said, wait a minute, I'm going to toss you down your little identity bracelet. So if a car hits you, they'll know who to call. And then later on, she said, why didn't you go to the gym? I said, oh, that's easy. And there's a number of reasons I didn't go to the gym. One of the reasons is this. At the gym, I've got a place I always park in. Right, that's my spot. I got my parking spot at the gym. And then when I go in the gym and go upstairs, I've got a treadmill. That is my treadmill. Right, I pay money for that one. And I know that if I go to the gym in January, somebody will be in my parking spot. In fact, parking will be difficult probably. And I know that if I go in and go upstairs, there will inevitably be somebody on my treadmill. And I am going to start a workout in such a bad frame of mind that it's way safer for me to wander around the road in the pitch black. Because <laughs> a lot of people think about looking after themselves at the start of the year. A number of years ago now, I, I can remember it pretty distinctly, we were down in Texas with our son and his family for Christmas, and I, I, t I remember this. I, I, was, I was getting sh a shave in the morning, and as I'm shaving that morning, a Bible verse came into my mind. It, it's in the book of Acts. And uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul is talking to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. He had planted that church. It was a big part of his heart and his passion. And he had been off church planting, preaching here, there. He'd come back to Ephesus now, and, and it wasn't gonna, he wasn't going to be there long, and he knew that he wouldn't be able to come back to Ephesus. This was going to be his last time there. So this is what he's telling them on his last time there. Acts 20 and verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Now obviously I knew that verse because it came into my memory, into my mind. But it hit me in a different way than it ever had before. I'd used this verse when I was talking to church leaders, to other pastors. I'd encourage them taking his words to these pastors where Paul said, you know what, you, you, really, you really need to watch over the flock. You're an overseer. Your main job is to care and watch over, to look after them. It's to shepherd them. And to remember how precious they are because Jesus bought them with his own blood. But you know what I had never done in years of knowing that verse and even using that verse to teach? What I had never, ever done is really take notice of the first four words. Keep watch over yourselves. And that morning, it like hit me like a brick. Keep watch over yourself. Keep watch over yourself. And it's like the, the, the impact of that was a reminder to me that actually my first responsibility, my first responsibility as a pastor is not to look after the people who are part of our church family. My first responsibility is I've got to look after me. Because if I don't look after me, I'm not going to be capable of looking after the people that God has made part of our church family. Is that fair? Keep watch over yourselves. Actually, a lot of other translations translate that a little more aggressively. It, they say, guard yourself. Guard yourself. I've kind of just made it a little more simple for the sake of this series. And I called this series, 
look after yourself. And what I want to encourage you to do as we go into this year is to make a point of looking after yourself in several different ways. And we're going to look at one today, one next week, and one the week after. The, the Song of Solomon is a fascinating book in the Bible. In some ways, it's difficult to understand. And in other ways, you wouldn't want your younger children to read it because it's a little bit detailed, a better relationship between a man and a woman. And there's one point in the Song of Solomon where it says this, uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, the, the woman is talking about herself, herself in a culture where, where to be really dark-skinned was frowned upon. And, and here's what she said. Don't look down on me because I'm dark, darkened by the sun's harsh rays. My brothers ridiculed me and sent me to work in the fields. They made me care for the face of the earth, but I had no time to care for my own face. And it could well be that this Sunday morning, there are some of us in here of whom that is true. I've cared for the face of the earth, but I haven't taken care of myself. And what I want to suggest to you this morning is this. You need to prioritize you. See, if I was to ask you today, who's the most important person in your life? You would say, Jesus. Is that right? Because we're in church and the answer to every question is generally Jesus, right? You know, it's a safe bet. Who died for us? Jesus. Who loves us more than anybody else? Jesus. Who's the most important person in your life? Jesus. All right, now that's a given. Who's next? Now, you might look at that and think, well, my family, my spouse, my children. But I want to tell you this. If you don't prioritize yourself, you're never going to be all you could be for everybody else who matters to you and whom you value in life. What matters most, the person who's most significant, the person who's going to get you f have first attention after Jesus is we need to look after ourselves. Now, I know that's contrary to all we've ever learned, right? When, when, when I was kind of uh, way, way, way younger, thank you, Charlotte, for the mention as the uh, senior member of the staff team or oldest member. Um, I remember we, in kids' ministry, we used to sing a little song that went J-O-Y. -J. It was the tune of Jingle Bells. You could have Christmas all year round. Right, J-O-Y, J-O-Y, surely this must be Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. But you know what? There's a lot to that, but error is truth taken to an extreme. The fact is, if you keep putting yourself last, you're going to have no steam for the others that you need to be a blessing to, and you need to be helping and encouraging and supporting. We need to look after ourselves. I was reading a book the, the uh, last year, earlier last year, a book called Thrive by Arianna Huffington, who would not necessarily uh, be someone I'd look to uh, read, but I, I heard her speaking and I wanted to read her book. And she tells the story that when she started the Huffington Post, it became incredibly successful and she was working 16 hours a day, absolutely loving it, nonstop, everything was going really, really well. Until she said she woke up on the floor beside her desk in a pool of blood. And what had happened was she had just collapsed because of fatigue. And as she fell to the floor, she gashed her head on the glass top of her desk. And she says, over the next few weeks, sitting in doctor's offices, waiting for everything conceivable to be checked out, she said, I, I did a heck of a lot of thinking, and I came to realize that I need to take better care of me. My life can't just be about my business. And she wrote the, that fascinating book. And the truth is, for all of us, unless we include our own well-being... In the way we live, unless we purposely look after ourselves, we'll be no use to anybody else and no use to the kingdom of God in the end. There are a lot of people, I mean a lot of people, who really are not overly happy with their lives. 
But I, I want to tell you, let, let me just tell you this story that perhaps illustrates this. When, when um, the third oldest member of our church staff was a little girl, three years old. I won't tell you who I'm talking about, okay? But um, when she was three years old, it was Christmas Day, and they were showing The Wizard of Oz on TV. And we're sitting down watching The Wizard of Oz. I think I might give her identity away with the next statement. She was sitting on my knee as a three-year-old, and she, was, she had her head kind of face into my chest, and she was crying because the witch and everything else going on was frightening her. And now and again, she'd turn around and look at the TV and come back. And I said, wait a second, I'm going to turn it off. Now, a lot of you people have got no idea what I'm going to say right now. In those days, you actually had to get up out of your chair and walk across the room. I know, weird, isn't it? Isn't it strange? You really did. So you thought twice about turning it off, you know? It's like the remote was over there, so, you know, the remote's over there. You're not sure if you changed the channel. We didn't have remotes. So I said, let me go and turn off. No, I'm watching it. So a little bit later. Now, come on, let, let, let's, just, let's, just, let's just go play a game. No, no, I want to see this. I want to see this. And she's there cowering and crying and wanting to see it. And that sometimes is a picture of where people get to in life. They're not happy with their life. They're uncomfortable with their life. They may be afraid uh, because of where they are. But let me tell you something. You've got the clicker for your life. You've got the clicker for your life. And with God's help and the guidance of God's Word, if you're not happy with where your life is, you actually have the power to change it. Look after yourself. So here's the focus for today, okay? If you're just visiting, that was the introduction. If you're a regular, you're thinking that was a short introduction. Here's where I want to focus today. I want to talk about the necessity to keep a clear head. Keep a clear head. Looking after myself means my mind needs to be in a good place. My thoughts need to be in a good place. And I need to be able to see things and think about things clearly. I can't live stressed out, overwhelmed, and be all the benefit I want to be to the people that love me and that I love and to the God that I'm serving. If I'm living stressed out, then the fact is I'm living subpar, okay? 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, the Apostle Paul says this, he says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion of Christ. How do you get led astray from your sincere devotion to Christ? The target is the mind. He says, I'm afraid that your minds will be led astray. You see, in the book of Proverbs, it says this, as a person thinks, that's how they are. So their mindset really very much defines them. So a person whose mind is full of worry is a worrier. A person who has, a, has anger filling his mind is going to be an angry person. A person who in their mind carries thoughts of unforgiveness is going to be an unforgiving person. A person with unclean thoughts in their minds is going to live an unclean life. A person whose mind is filled with the peace of God is going to be a person who, who emanates peace to everybody around them. The mind is such a key thing. In Philippians chapter 4 uh, and verse 5, it says this, Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding, look at this, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul saying here, listen, the antidote to anxiety is to have your mind guarded and your mind guarded by the peace of God. 1 Peter 1 and verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, 
set your heart on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So he's saying, if you want to be focused on Jesus and the things about Jesus, you need to have a mind that is alert and fully sober. That's using sober in its widest sense, but in its initial sense, that's good too. Minds that are alert. You've got to keep your mind alert. You've got to keep a clear head. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, right? Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Look at this next phrase. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul's saying here, he, he, he says, you, you know what, part of what Jesus wants to do for you is to renew your mind, the attitude of your mind. And, and some of you here today, it, it might be that you're, you know, you're here and, and kind of you almost didn't come here because you're already fried in your minds thinking, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to take care of that. I've got so many other things to do. Others of you may be here today and you, you know, it could, it could be that you're coming in and out of what's happening here because you, your mind's on things that are going on in life outside of here and, and you've got all kinds of stresses and worries and tensions. And, and one of the things we need to really get a grip on if we're going to keep a clear head is how to manage stress. How to manage stress. Some of you may say, well, you know, you don't really know much about this, Roger. You, you, you know, you, you pastor the church. Okay, well, we'll just move on from there. I think most of you got the point there, right? <laughs> how we manage stress is, is, is so important. You see, stress is a part of life. Hey, Jesus said in this world, you're going to have problems. And stress is a major problem in life in the 21st century, which, when you think about it, is so weird. My mother raised five children in a small three-bedroom brownstone with no bathroom, no refrigerator. I guess that means she went food shopping every day no refrigerator, no washing machine. Imagine that, seven people. And then they invented electricity. And no. <laughs> but she didn't. I'm, I'm like trying to think through. I don't, the, the other day when I'm thinking about this, you know, Monday was laundry day for my mother. And, and, and she just, she just in the, at the kitchen sink, there was a big kitchen sink, and she filled it with hot water and whatever else, and she had this scrubbing board thing, and she cleaned all of the clothes, and, sh -sh -sh -sh. and she rinsed them all. She had no dryer. It was unbelievable. But we live such a charmed life with all these things that make life easier. And we're more stressed out than my mother ever was, as far as I know, Right? I mean, I mean, you don't, you know, a few weeks ago, at, you know, we got a great Christmas arrangement. Joe buys everybody's gifts and I pay the Amex bill. <laughs> Works, worked for years. I love that. No problem. But, but she was, Joe, Joe was kind of getting a little bit anxious. You know, we got to get these gifts. I'm going to get them to the UK and these we got to send here and these. We gotta, and I said, do me a favor. Just leave it alone. Friday afternoon, I've got an hour clear. Leave it to me. So... I did not chase around stores finding gifts, take them home, wrap them, put them in parcels, take them to the post office and send them to people. I went to my best friend, Amazon Prime. <laughs> right? And I went to Amazon.co.uk. Right? Yeah, and I paid a buck or two extra to have them gift wrapped, sent, delivered, done. So within an hour, all the Christmas shopping, we live with so many things to make life so much easier, and yet we live so stressed. And if our minds are stressed, then the reality is that's how we're going to live. That's how we're going to be. Our quality of life is going to be reduced. Our ability to be a help and a blessing support to those who are part of our circle will be reduced. And, and, and our effectiveness in areas where we serve God is going to be reduced as well. So learning to manage stress 
is such a significant thing. So how do you do it? Well, the Bible tells us something about it, right? I'm not trying to be Dr. Phil. I have more hair than he has. And that's not, I can't say that of many people, but no, the Bible has things to say. In uh, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, Joshua said this to the people of Israel as they were preparing to enter into the land God had promised them. He said, don't for a minute let this book of the Revelation, that's the Bible as they had it, be out of mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll succeed. How many of you would like to get... God, play along with me. How many of you would like to succeed? What's wrong with the rest of you? All right, so that's right. So, so you want to get where you're going, and we want to succeed. And Joshua says, if you're going to do that, you need to ponder and meditate what this book says. When I was uh, uh, in my early teens, my pastor was, he was a great guy, but I tell you, he kept encouraging us, keeping us on our toes. Some evenings I'd go to something in the church or any given evening, it could be any time I saw him. And he would say to me, what did you read in the Bible today, Roger? That keeps you on your toes because, you, you know, either you, you will have read your Bible or you're going to lie to your pastor. Lying to your pastor is not a good thing. That was one of the things, honestly, that helped me keep focused with my daily devotions and my daily Bible reading was I knew he might ask me at any given time. And I remember one day he said to me, um, what do you read? So I told him, he said, what do you get from it? I said, well, it said this and this. So he said, look, you need to be like a cow. That's really good when your pastor tells you that, right? And I looked at him. He said, you know how cows eat? I said, well, they eat grass. He said, you know how they eat? I said, well, they chew it. He said, no, here's how cows eat. He said, they can eat an incredible amount of grass, and they'll eat to their full. Then they'll find some place to lay down. He said, and then they'll eat their food. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, what they do is they fill their stomachs, and then he said they can, I'm sorry about this, but everybody finish their bagels? <laughs> he said, they can bring it back up again. And then they chew it over again and chew it over again and get all of the goodness out of it. The first time, they just swallow it all down. The second time, they get all of the goodness out of the grass. He said, you need to be like a cow. So I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you read the Bible. But he said, then you need to take a little bit of it and just think it over quietly. And he said, the Bible calls that meditating. Never forgotten that. Never forgotten that. I got nervous about meditation a little later on in the 60s when it became weird. <laughs> right? And it, and it became associated with like Eastern religions and weirdos. I was like, yeah, okay then. And And you know, it's important for us not to get nervous of stuff that some people have taken and used for their ends when actually the word meditate appears first in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And one of the things that helps us to keep our mind focused is to meditate on God's Word. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that if, if, if I, if I um, read a passage like uh, John, I'm going to play games with you here. Can you go back to Ephesians 4.22 for me, please? Whoa, you're good. <laughs> that if I'd read this, if I read, you know, you were taught with regard to your former way to put off the old self, which is being corrupted, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, put on the new self, created to be like God. So that's my reading. That's what I take in. And then I take back from that, I'm created to be like God. I'm created to be like God. And I pull back for a few minutes. I'm created to be like God. I am created to be like God. I am created.
created to be like God. And I keep chewing that over and over until it really becomes a part of me. How do you deal with stress? Meditate. Take something God says, a word, a phrase. And you don't have to sit with your legs crossed and your hands like this and, and hum chants, you know. I, you know where I've, I've found help, helps me lately? Do you ever go to the supermarket and go to the, go to the checkout, the express checkout line? Yeah? yeah? You head for there often, right? I go to there. I, I, can, I can almost become an unchristian in that line. Because I'm good at math and I can't. So if I'm like the third person in the line, as the first person putting their stuff out, I'm counting. You know, because if they if that's 16 and not 15, that that really messes with me. Now look at the person in front of me and think you got 27. I'm sure. And you know one of the things I've learned just recently. In a checkout line, I breathe. And as I breathe, I'll take a phrase from what I've read that morning or a word from what I've read this morning. I'm loved by God. I am loved by God. Take moments, take moments regularly to pull back or else stress will accumulate in your life. Sometimes as well as, 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 as the, the next step, and we're kind of there really, breathe in the broader sense. In, Matthew, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 31, it says this. Then because so many people were coming and going that they, that's Jesus and his disciples, did not have chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now listen, there are times in our lives if we're going to look after ourselves, we need to start thinking, how can I get some rest? Now, you may say that's easy for you. You don't have little kids around the place. You know, you may say, you know, I've got these... You know, constantly, I've got them here all the time. The only rest I can get is to go to the bathroom and lock the door quick. But if Jesus and his said to his disciples, you need to come aside for a little while and you need to get some rest, we need to learn how to take some rest. We need to learn to pull back for ourselves. You say, I don't have time to do that. Listen, you're going to have one time for one of two things. You're going to have time to look after yourself, or you're going to have time to cope with the consequences of not looking after yourself. My life is a gift from God, and your life is a gift from God. Do you agree with that? We were born with a divine purpose, every one of us. Do you believe that? If I want to fulfill the divine purpose, number one, the first step is I've got to look after me. And if I don't look after me, the cares of this life will draw me away from God. Third thing I want to say is a good thing to help us keep our minds focused is be thankful. Be thankful. Now, you might be sitting here today and you think, my life sucks. And the truth is, it doesn't totally suck. It may suck 99% just now where you're sitting right now. But maybe you need to focus on the 1% and be thankful. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 says this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you called to peace. Look at the next three things. And be thankful. And be thankful. Be thankful. Do you see that's a positive sort of thing? It's a doing thing? Be thankful. How can I be thankful? Well, maybe we need sometimes to pause and just to kind of remind ourselves of how many things we've got to be thankful for. Maybe to start the day by thinking about three things that are really in my favor this morning. To end the day by thinking about three things that really were happy things today. Be thankful. And the fourth thing that can help us when it comes to guarding our minds is learn to say no. Oh, that struck a nerve. See, most of us are people pleasers, right? 
All right, pretend you're not. Okay. We want people to like us, yeah? No, that's not make, that's, I didn't say you're a bad person. We want people to like us. And because we want people to like us, we tend to always say yes. And sometimes we've got to say no. Because some of, for some of us, the chaos in our lives is because we don't draw boundaries and we haven't learned to say no. And what I want to encourage you in going forward in looking after yourself is to be willing this week and this year to say no. Some of you might need to say no to your kids because you're doing more miles than an Uber driver. And you have to, you know, do they really need to go to a zillion things? Oh, we want to give them the opportunity. So you know what? You're flat broke because you're paying for so much stuff for them. And you don't have a moment to yourself because you're driving around all over the place. And sometimes you've got to say no to your kids. And they may not like you in the moment. Your children will not always like you. Wow. I thought some people would say amen there, but okay. Our children did not always like us anyway. So, But you've got to learn to say no. You've got to set boundaries to look after you. I've got two minutes. I'm about halfway through. <laughs> Let me do the last bit real quick. Okay. Do take note of whatever of those things really struck a chord. If you can't remember what they are, go to the Bible app on your phone. If you go to more down below, uh, you, you can then hit on something next. Somebody bail me out. You hit on something else and our church comes up. Uh, and everything I've said this morning, what I had to leave out is there, okay? But the second major thing that I wanted to talk about this morning is this. Managing stress is significant. And the second is remember who you are. Remember who you are. And, and I'm going to just make this real quick, real short. You've got to remind yourself over and over again of who you are. And you do that how, whatever way you can. You might want to take a phrase, a statement, and you might want to put it somewhere prominent, make it a screensaver on your computer, put it on the home screen of your phone, put it on your refrigerator. But tell yourself things like this. Remind yourself of things like this. Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Remind yourself who you are. Remember who you are, because life itself and the world around us will suck us dry and will, will, will rob us of our identity so that we can forget who we are. The Lord is my shepherd, I will not want. John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, Jesus said. I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might bear, go and bear fruit. Go and bear fruit. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when I rush. Who am I? I'm chosen by Jesus. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I'm not here today because I chose Jesus. I'm here today because Jesus chose me, and so are you. Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Remind yourself who you are. I am a co-heir with Christ. How do you keep a clear head? It comes down to two things. Manage stress. Notice that that is an active statement. You've got to take steps if you're going to manage it. Manage stress and remember who you are. And then finally, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Notice the next phrase, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Look after yourself this year. Look after yourself. And that starts with taking steps to keeping a clear head. And above everything else, keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray together. And as we pray, I just want to take a a moment for you just in your heart to 
Say yes to God. If God's kind of spoken into your mind, your heart, while I've been talking, said, I need to do this. Just take the moment and say, yes, Lord, I am going to do that. I am going to do that. What's your first step? What's your next step now? Going out of here today, if you're challenged to look after yourself, what's your next step towards keeping a clear head? Father, help us, I pray, with your guidance and your word leading us. Help us to be everything you planned for us to be today and in this year that's ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, and we'll sing with the band as we draw to a close today.